Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Fantastic. How are you? Oh, I'm well, thank you. That was a f- great game. 4-1 Oilers over the LA Kings. And uh, Bruce... That was a pretty strong hockey game from the Edmonton Oilers. I've been starting to wonder if we'd ever see that team again that we saw in the winning streak that played such disciplined defensive hockey. And tonight, just from the start, they they were that team again. They were that team. The grade A shots, Bruce, were 13 to 12 or 12 to 11 for the Oilers with a subset of five alarm shots, five to four for the Oilers. Um, the owners had were pretty dominant until the end of the game when the Kings had seven straight last seven, eh? Grade A shots, yeah, the last seven in the game, trying to pull their way back into it. So before then, it was twelve to four for the owners in Grade A shots as they were building their lead, methodically building their lead. Not bad. Yep, little score effects there at the end with LA pushing and Edmonton just trying to drain the clock. Uh, but they had long stretches, I thought, where they uh, uh, they were just so aggressive on the puck. They wouldn't let L.A. get set up. They were winning battles. They were doing a great job of preventing them getting into the zone, standing up at the blue line, and then winning the race of the puck and, you know, mostly making good plays with it, give or take Matthias Ekholm on one and Vincent Deharney on another. But for the most part, there was some... Uh, pretty pretty clean puck handling in their own end of the ice. Got a little bit ragged there down the stretch, but uh, by then they'd done enough damage at the good end to uh, to establish, a, you know, I won't say comfortable, but a clear lead. It was fairly comfortable. Bruce, this is our two good things, two bad things and two numbers podcast with one conundrum. Bruce, um, we'll go with two good things each because you wanted to do. Go do. two good things each. So, what's your first? No, yeah, I'm going to single out a couple of guys that I thought stood out to me. Uh, Evan Bouchard is the first uh, guy, and Bouchard had a goal and assist plus one. He was on for the goal against, but had zero to do with that. Um, but what I liked about Bouchard's game the most tonight was his command of the game, and in all three zones, I thought he had a terrific defensive game, Evan Bouchard. I thought he was uh, in the right spot. He was winning races to the puck. He skates better than he's generally credited for when you know when the puck is shot behind the D and there's some forward steaming on him. He wins the race uh, most of the time. And when he does win it, it's just one look and one clean pass and puck's going the other way. And that play just happened, it seemed like, again and again. And I just thought he just looked like a, a, a commanding presence out there you know not i won't say similar to Doughty, and certainly not in the way he plays but in terms of the way that uh when the puck went to his side of the ice there was not a whole lot to worry about and uh uh that was uh uh that was great to see and then of course we saw an excellent example of the bush bomb uh that made it three nothing early in the uh, third period that uh really stretched the lead just an absolute not even necessarily a rocket. I don't know how hard that shot would have been measured, but perfectly placed. Like it was teed up for him and he just boomed it one time or just right inside the post. And Cam Talbot, who had, I thought, a pretty strong game for a guy who was faced only was it 19 shots, but he made a number of really good saves to keep his team relatively close in this game, but he didn't stop that one. And, uh, so Bush wound up, and he also had a secondary assist on the uh, on the McDavid goal that opened the scoring. So a nice all-around game for uh, Edmonton's, uh, dare I say, Norris Trophy candidate. He's certainly going to be in the running. He, I'll say second All-Star team candidate. Yeah, that would look there. good. That would look good. Yeah, uh, second you know, All-Star. I, I don't think the Norris Trophy is within reach. I think it's Quinn Hughes. He's like the Brad Park of the Oilers here. <laughs> second All-Star. Uh, yeah, he. you know, it's funny. Like, uh, um, He's often been compared to Larry Murphy. 
mm -hmm. um, the old Maple Leafs. By me man. for years, actually, but yes, he has. And um, he sometimes, I've compared him to Zubov. I think in some ways that's mm. an inexact comparison when I think about it. Zubov was exceptional because of his skating, I think. Mm -hmm. So the puck handling and the, and the vision is the same as Zubov. But in this game, it's more like Al McKinnis that comes to mind, Bruce. Just a big, tall defenseman who could pass the hell out rangy. of the puck and shoot rangy and shoot the hell out of the puck and played some solid defense, smart defense, but not physical. And that's Evan Bouchard. So maybe um, Al McKinnis is the top end comparison um, for Evan Bouchard. Although Larry Murphy isn't a bad comparison. Um, he did end up in the Hall of Fame. He did. Evan Bouchard. Bruce, my, my uh, bold prediction at the start of the year that is he'd get as many as 90 points. Um, for Bouchard, which I don't think many other people were saying at the time. Mm -hmm. I think mo I think the a more common prediction was 60 points, 60 yeah. to 70. Um, I didn't see why he couldn't get 90. He had 37 that. points, 32 games after Barry was traded, something like that. And um, he's on track for 86. So um, if he plays the rest of the season at the uh, total that he's at now, he's got seven, 74 points in 71 games. So, uh, yeah, it's not looking so bad, not looking so crazy. All right, Bruce, my good thing will be the Oilers' physical play and disciplined play um, early in the game. I just think um, Evander Kane's hit on Drew Doughty set the tone for that game. Drew Doughty is, he is a fierce a player who has tormented the Edmonton Oilers for years. And he has led um, the King's manhandling of the Oilers for years, I'm mm -hmm. going to suggest. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I think the Oilers kind of manhandled the Kings tonight a bit. It would, they turned the tables on this team, which is used to bossing the Oilers. The Oilers bossed the Kings. And it was so refreshing to see that. And it started with Kane barreling in there and getting a pretty dirty hit almost a knee-on-knee -knee hit on Doughty. And I think it kind of did take the wind out of Doughty a little bit uh, through the game. He didn't seem to be quite his troubling and charismatic self um, in this in this match. Then there was another fantastic hit. Blake Lazat um, irritated the snot out of every Oilers fan on earth, running Stuart Skinner and slew footing Leon Dreisaitl on, mm -hmm. on a play. So it was a slew foot. He should have got, I think it should have been a five minute. You slew foot someone, five minutes, you're you're done. And. Um, but nope, let's even it up for a little love yeah, tap let's, in retaliation. Yeah. So McDavid, yeah. Connor McDavid drilled him into the boards. His, I think his head hit the boards, Lazat. It was a really hard and nasty hit on McDavid on Lazat. No penalty, so maybe that was the even up call that there was no penalty. He hit him on, on the shoulder, but uh, but his head the, did then. But the, yeah, yeah, he did bounce. He did bounce him into the bars. It could have been boarding, and that took Lazat kind of out of the game too. I'm going to suggest we didn't see much well, much annoying um, good, stuff. He was going to hurt someone the way he was going. What an ass! He was, you know, that slew foot on dry subtle. It's it should be a double minor. I don't, minor. Like, I don't know what Leon gonna... for being choked at no. Him. No, you get slew footed. You're mad because yeah. it's dangerous. Yeah. You fall back on the ice. You could smash your head. Like who knows what's going to happen? My ankle, your sprain, or whatever. <laughs> oh, I was ticked off, Bruce. Anyway, yeah. um, I love the Oilers' physical play um, mm -hmm. this game, and especially um, that that effort. You know, they didn't, Bruce. According to our count, they didn't didn't give up one grade A shot mm -hmm. in the entire first period, and they had five and a goal. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if the Oilers mm. are going to win the Stanley Cup, that's the hockey they've got to play. And you know what? Again, I I was starting to wonder, are they going to win the Cup? Because we hadn't seen that play in so long. We, we had seen it for a stretch of, let's say, six weeks, two months to six weeks. And um, it was really encouraging. And then it went away. It went away. And I think, in fairness, it's really hard to play that way. Um, for a full NHL regular season, it's going to come and go to be that physical, intense, mm -hmm. yeah. and disciplined. And all three of them are difficult. All three of them are hard. Yeah, the, the discipline's hard because hockey is such a. 
it's such a difficult game because it turns on a dime between offense to defense more than any other sport. I think the quickness between offense and defense is there. It just happens instantly. And if you, and if you, if you're trying to go for it just a little too much, if you just take just a small amount of risk too much, you pay, you can pay for it with a goal against, mm-hmm. and it happens rapidly. So that that discipline part, getting those decisions right, I think is really a challenge for any NHL team. And the owners, I think in some ways, that was the biggest thing they got away from was those kind of little judgments. They started to cheat for offense a bit too much again, which is their, which they are want to do, as the expression mm-hmm. goes. So, um, but tonight they they got it all right. The discipline, the intensity, and the physicality. And I think they're going to be able, I'm getting, uh, that was a hopeful sign for the playoffs. Yeah, well, they landed uh, officially 49 hits in this game, which may be a season high. It would certainly be very close to it, including seven from Nurse, six from, am I reading this right? Six from Henrique, six from Kane, five from Nugent Hopkins, who played a very strong and, and hard edge game tonight, especially for him. Like it's, But he won a lot of battles out there. And five for McDavid as well. And four for Janmark. Like they had a lot of guys that were were uh, chopping wood and carrying water in this game. Oh. Yeah, there was a <laughs> lot. Of, there was a lot of good hits in that game for sure, Bruce. Um, what's your second good thing? Yeah, I'm going to go to the next guy on the event summary. Another right shot defenseman, Cody Cece. And I thought Cece played his best game in weeks. Tonight, he looked more comfortable back home beside Darnell Nurse, and I just thought we saw hit the game that we sort of used to seeing from this guy who's been struggling for quite a while. And I thought he was uh, very strong defensively. Uh, he was involved in in the uh, uh, engaged in the battles. He was moving the puck well along the boards and, and out of his own zone. He was preventing plays at the blue line. And he even was on the ice for, uh, uh, well, he himself had a couple of very good shots on net by jumping into the play. Uh, and uh, one that he was set up in front by, I think it was McDavid off the, was that the, no, oh, maybe have the wrong one. Anyway, that he had uh, one from the slot that was basically a one-timer and then another one from the left side that Talbot just barely got enough of. But you don't expect necessarily offense from Cody Cece. If one of those goes in, it's a pleasant surprise. And lo and behold, we did get a pleasant surprise when he hit the empty net from a very long distance uh, to seal the deal with uh, uh, 40 seconds left. I just want to check something. How long was that shot on net? Uh 171 feet officially. It seemed longer. And anyway, I thought that was a reward to a player who uh, who earned it tonight. He he played a hard, tough, honest game like he often does. But I just thought he was he was more. He wasn't chasing and he wasn't being overtaken like he was. He was uh, um, right in the in the battle and winning more than his share of battles and and gave the Evans. The Oilers a solid game on the uh, second pairing. He um, he had a super rough February. He was really struggling, and um, in May in March he's slowly been getting his game back. He's slowly been playing better and better, and he got a lot of criticism. And I mean, both you and I talked, discussed, and we both agreed yep. that he should sit and St- Stetcher should play. Yep. Um, that has yet to happen. I actually think it's it's still should happen. They should be rotating him out and DeHarnay out and Stetcher in to see what they have in Stetcher. And um, I don't necessarily think it's like you have to sit DeHarnay now because he had a, a, a some bad moments out there tonight. I don't, wouldn't say a bad game, but he had some really iffy moments. Run one terrible turnover that led to three yeah. five alarm shots. Yeah. Um, but like a, you, you could sit CeCe after tonight. Like that would be okay too. You just say, listen, you just had a really good game, but we want to keep you fresh for the playoffs and we need to see what we have in this depth player that we've acquired. So we're, we're, we're going to go off a bit of rotation here. You're going to every now and then you're going to be out of game and Troy will be getting in. And I I think they should do that with him and DeHarnay. Uh, But he's, he is coming on and this was his best game 
in a while. Since it was his best game since January. Probably. So good for Cody Cece, uh, mm-hmm. my spirit oiler, the player that I emulate when I'm playing hockey. He it's caught for my, sound positional play. He caught my eye early in a good way, and I just kept watching him throughout the game and waiting for the other shoe to drop, and it really never did. Yeah. And so good stuff from Cody. Yeah, that was the pass. The, the one timer he got was from Dry Settle, the first pass. Right. And the other one, uh, I'm not sure who passed that. All right, Bruce, you're, are we, what are we now? Your second good, oh, you just did your second good. Mm-hmm. That's my second, good, my yeah. other good thing. I'll, I'll go with Connor McDavid. Um, he's just flying out there. I, 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 I don't know if he's going to win the MVP. Um, and I, and I don't think he'll be robbed if Nathan McKinnon wins the MVP. But I think Connor McDavid is the NHL's MVP. Bruce, he's the best hockey player in the NHL right now. And um, there's there's just two or three times a game when he makes a quick cut on his skates with the the puck, you know, this way and that way. And I just we 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 Gosh. rewind it three or four times and we watch it again. And it's just it's just we're just ooing and awing at the way whom he he moves with the puck. Um, he had three points tonight, one goal and two assists for three points. He's he he uh, his goal was <laughs> astonishing because uh, and this was brought up after the game. Like, did he knock down that puck on purpose or was he trying to tip it? And I can't, you know, Connor McDavid doesn't tip in a lot of goals. Mm-hmm. Um, I can hardly remember him tipping in any goals. His first He's, career not, goal and about three more since then, it seems like. But yes, yeah, not not his style. So like the the idea that he might have been trying to knock it down is not out of this world. Like that's what might have been his his play. Anyway, he did knock it down, and then he calmly, he's so calm. Like he, at the same time as being so fast, he's calm, and um, he's the he's the the kayak navigating down rapids, you know, yeah. wild rapids. Yeah. He says that that. Uh, the calm kayak that's, that's a really making good, all yeah. the right moves. And uh, he knocked it down and just confidently tucked it in the net. What a great player. Quickly and calmly deep Talbot tucked it in. Indeed. Bruce, <laughs> what's your bad thing? Yeah. Well, I was, if they'd hung on for the shutout, I was going to go with Nikita Kucherov goal sucking for the empty netter last night to take the lead in the scoring race. His team defending a 2-1 lead and him hanging out in the neutral zone while his buds are playing four against six. And when they ice it, he wins the race to the icing and tucks it in. Hated that. Anyway, yeah, my real okay. bad thing is the one goal by the Kings. And just, I thought... Um, uh, a little bit of a bad decision by Ekholm in the sense that he had full possession of the puck and he could have like taken it on his forehand and made a real strong pass, you know, around the boards and at least out to where it could be battled near the blue line. And at his last minute, he changed his mind and he tried to chop it on his backhand side and he just completely whiffed it. And it went right to... Uh, uh, Quinton Byfield, and before you could say Quinton Byfield, it was on and off the stick of Arthur Kaliev and in the net. What a wicked shot that guy has! And they, they just pounced. And I bet you in the game and the thing like the the turnover and the goal were like one second apart. In fact, I can tell you exactly that. A giveaway at six sixteen, goal at six thirteen. Okay. Anyway, it happened fast. And it was just a bad turnover, and and it turned out to be a painful one that broke the shutout and made the last few minutes of the game a little more tense. And they would have been at three nothing. And so Matthias Ekholm, I'm not sure if he's ever been my bad thing before, not very often. And uh, this was just a bad play, as opposed to him having a bad game or anything. It was just one one moment that went awry. You can make bad or you can make great passes all game long, yep. right? And screw and one then, up. And then and hey. then you screw it up and it's in the back <laughs> of the net, right? And you, yeah. And your teammates are looking at you, they bench like you got a horn growing out of the middle of your head. Um, <laughs> it's not my bad thing is a similar thing with Daharney. There was actually two plays from Vinny um that I'll go with my bad thing. Okay. And uh, the first one is uh, a minute left, about a minute left. And <laughs> 
he's behind the net. He tries a second tricky, period. Eh? Yeah, second period. Excuse me. Tries a tricky, kind of a diff, difficult pass. I think he was on his backhand up the middle of the ice, mm-hmm. and he just gave it away. Um, and it, there was three absolutely fearsome um, shots. Um, the first shot in tight, then the rebound, which I think was the most deadly of the chances. There was a rebound chance. And then there was a scramble chance and all three of them were five alarm shots. Just, you know, how they didn't score then. And that would have been a pretty tough time to give up a goal mm-hmm. because the orders just uh, had a one goal lead at that point. And they scored soon after that. Kempe, so, Kopiter and Byfield, like those three pretty good players to be getting point blank scoring chances in rapid succession. Skinner somehow kept them all out. Then when they're up three, nothing. So this is a little less, scary he made a uh the orders were in the king's end he made a he came charging in on the pinch boy that's a bad decision because you're up three nothing yeah. you don't need to pinch oh. and you pinch like you, you you have to keep playing aggressive um yeah. hockey you have to be on your but that you have to be smart and aggressive at the same time you have to get that risk reward correct and like i said this is a really difficult thing to do in hockey it's it's you know, and the defensemen are always, especially the defensemen, right? Like the wingers, the risk reward, they're generally just going for it, right? Like they don't have to necessarily make these calculations all the time. But the defensemen are always doing that. You know, should they move up? Should they move back? Should they should they force the play? Should they mm-hmm. should they back off the play? Like, and not easy to get right. And he got it wrong this time, and it led to a two on one rush by the um, by the Los Angeles Kings and a really good shot on net, as I recall. So Byfield, wasn't it? It was or yeah, Dubois. It was a guy came. To, yeah, the guy who carried the puck made a wicked shot, and Skinner made a terrific stop. Or was that it Kempe? Time. I can't. My it, it, yeah, I can't remember exactly who it was that shot, but it was a good save. And um, anyway, so two instances there where DeHarnay got that risk reward incorrect, and uh, but <laughs> no goals against so. There's that. What's your number, Bruce? Yeah, I'm going to go with uh, officially seven minutes and 39 seconds. And that was the stretch of play uh, in the second period. It started with a face-off at 8.39 and ended with another uh, whistle at 59.6 seconds left on the clock. It was just continuous action, back and forth, back and forth. I hit 15 times my 30-second forward button it was just still continuous action throughout as i looked at the replay of it and it just was kind of it tells a story about how this game was played like f- very fast and 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 yet pretty tight and I, i'm just going to read from the game summary this is what happened in these plays not i'm not going to give names or anything but hit giveaway block hit 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 shot by hyman hit 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 Block, take away, hit, hit, give away, hit, hit, block, 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 give away, take away, shot, 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 which is a three by LA after the uh, uh, DeHarnay turnover, which was credited as a takeaway by Byfield. And then finally, a uh, offside and, and uh, very late TV timeout with, uh, you know, just all this continuing, uh, continuous action. And most of it was just around the puck, either guys getting hit or, you know, turnovers or block shots. Like it was mostly defensive stuff that showed up in the summary for this entire stretch. And it wasn't exciting, but it also wasn't boring. It was just, you know, a good hard hockey and it just kept going and going and going. And that's a, I, I would think exceptionally long time between whistles. So that caught my eye. Indeed. Bruce, my number is one. And that's the one point that got away from Connor McDavid. I was just, I was like, when they got it, I was actually kind of, when they got it to 3 1, I was thinking, oh, good. Uh, it's going to be an empty net situation for McDavid, and he might get another point here. He had three. And, uh, and he was out there for a lengthy shift, and he had a couple chances where he might have scored, but he was unable to. So, um, and you know, you bringing up Kucherov and getting Maybe that. Maybe he should point. have done the Kucherov and hung yeah. around an empty net merchant. 
Sounds like Kucherov. Um, but anyway, he got three. He's got 122. McKinnon has 123. He didn't get a point tonight. And Excellent. Kucherov has 124. So McDavid's two back from Kucherov. Um, wow. And one back Ooh. from McKinnon. He's been, Bruce, I think he was as much as, what, 19 or 20 behind? Yeah. 19, at one point. I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, I think that for some reason 19 is in my head too. Um, behind Kucherov. So I say whoever wins the Art Ross should win the Hart Trophy. <laughs> That's my argument. Um, actually, if you win the Hart, Hart Trophy and the plus minus for of those three guys, then you should win the, the Hart Trophy. So McKinnon's plus 31. McDavid's plus 28. And um, McKinnon's got 123. McDavid's got 122. This is a close race. I think actually they're... They're the two guys that are are the serious finalists. Um, although I suspect be, the NA, you know the NHL voters being the way they are, and the fact they like to spread these awards around, that McKinnon will win it. But um, yeah, just that one point that would have been nice. One more point. One more point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's here's the empty net goal or empty net point standings. Nikita Kucherov, 11. Uh-huh. Seven empty net goals, four assists, 11. Nathan McKinnon, seven. And I got to scroll way down here. I think McDavid's in here somewhere. Uh, McDavid, five. So that's the difference in the scoring race. If you just counted real points scored against goalies, I think McDavid would be in the lead. I don't think there's any can- chance Kucherov's winning the MVP. I don't, but uh-huh. Taylor Hall won it, so you never know. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, uh, Hall did have a, quite a remarkable run of he had a good a year. playoff run where he kept scoring huge goals and points and games that they kept winning by one. The Devils and just was a perfect storm. Yeah, the narrative. Oh, yeah, there was lots of people who wanted to pile on Peter Shirelli for trading him too. So nope. um, that was also Better part believe. of the uh, narrative. Bruce, um, our conundrum. Hmm. Uh, this is coming from something Bob Stoffer said earlier today or yesterday on the radio, I think it was. Corey Perry wants to play another year of hockey. Oh, yeah. In the NHL. Mm-hmm. Based on what you've seen so far, and I know the decision is going to be made down the road when there's more information, how he's done on the regular for the, for the full regular season and how he does in the playoffs. Listen, that we, we both know, everyone knows that will decide it, right? It's too early to say, but given that based on what you've seen so far, just if you just had to base it on that, yes or no, no would you give him a new contract? Uh, well, I'd certainly have to think long and hard about it. He, he's shown some good stuff. Uh, he he sure brings his game face every night. It's my experience with this guy. It's such a sour puss. It was his 1300th NHL game tonight. This is, you know, there's long in the tooth and there's long in experience. And he's definitely got a ton of the latter because that doesn't include about 100 international games that he's played over that same long and fairly storied career i like a lot of what he brings david i I would have to think uh, that if he wanted to sign for a reasonable dollar similar to what he did this year like if he wants two million no if he's willing to come in at or below one million then uh uh it would be worth considering and the, the only thing stopping it would be are do you have a guy that that he's completely blocking from the NHL that, that, you know, you know, I'm thinking specifically, frankly, of Raphael Lavoie in this moment. At the other hand, you can say, well, Corey Perry's done this, 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 and this in the NHL, and Raphael Lavoie has done basically nothing. Uh, but he's a younger, sort of somewhat similar style, like a big power forward. Uh, and uh, he, uh, but uh, I, I do find that, the combination of skills and edginess that uh, Perry brings to be quite fun to watch, to be honest. So I wouldn't mind another year of that. What do you yeah. think? Yeah. Um, 
I think that the key is obviously the contract. So I think we're probably assuming that he signs a contract for less than like 1.1 million or less. Okay. So that way, if he doesn't pan out, if he's if he's done, then he goes to the minors and he doesn't count against your cap, right? right? There's no cap yet. So and 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 it's probably he would sign for closer to the league minimum, and then he'd actually be a like a bonus player on your roster if he if he's capable of playing because because he's um, so low against the cap. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, it, it's, uh, if he wanted to sign for that kind of contract based on what I've seen, yeah, I would definitely sign him. And I don't think he's blocking Raphael Lavoie. Raphael Lavoie has to make his own breaks. Right. He, and, and he has to do that by the next time he gets a chance by playing more like Corey Perry, by being more aggressive and more, he's got to, he's got to be more physical. He's got to play more around the net. Um, he, otherwise he's not going to make it. Right. I mean, he, he's, this is, he, he, Raphael Lavoie was on waivers and nobody took him. Mm-hmm. Every NHL team had a, ch- a chance at yeah. him. He's having a good year, but this is it's his fourth year as a yeah. pro. And you'd expect him to have a good year in the AHL. Lots of people do when they're 24, 23, 24, 25, whatever he is now. So I'm not against Raphael Lavoie making it. Mm-hmm. And I think he can. I think there's a possibility. But he's 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 no shoe in, and and you you, you right. need tons of competition. You need lots of players, and the more you can sign in this million dollar range and below, the better in some ways. So Perry is he's I just find him a fascinating hockey player because he is really slow, but he's got he's great hands. Unique, okay. Yeah, he's got great hands, and he and he wins pucks on the board still, huh. and he is he is way harder to play against than I ever imagined just watching him every game, even now, not yeah. in his, now that I'm focused on him, he is, yeah, he is right tough as DNA. nails. He is so competitive. And I think on a team, um, with Evander Kane, you know, a volatile, let's, let's, you know, it's, you know, there's, there's some volatility around Evander Kane coming out right now. He's, he event, you know, got benched for a game and he's, He's complained about his ice time this year and blah, blah, blah. And he's been up and down as a player. I think having players like Perry around um, balances, you know, it's just good to have this mix of veteran players on the team. And I suspect that he's quite a driven, but I'm guessing fairly calm person um, to deal with and just helps the team keeps its even keel, that kind of veteran. Because that's how he certainly looks. He never, even when he's fighting, he looks rather even killed. I mean, he was very smart fighting that Mount Logan Stanley guy. <laughs> he, he, he just, he didn't take hardly a punch because he was so smart in that fight. So yeah, I like the player. I like what I've seen and, and there, there'll be room for Dylan Holloway and Lavoie to make the team. Um, if they sign him, I mean, the orders are going to have a hell of a time signing Warren Fogle. As far as I can tell, I think Warren Fogle is going to get like $4 million from somebody. And, um, especially if he does well in the playoffs, but, yeah, um, well, the well if he does well in the playoffs, he can get even more than that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I'd give him a contract. Yeah. Raphael Lavoie, I watched the game Bakersfield was playing last night and I had it on in the, while I was writing it, my post. So I sort of half watching it and half, you know, anyway, uh, Lavoie scored, uh, got a really nice assist where he, where he, uh, bullied the puck into the slot and fired a wicked shot that the goalie couldn't contain. And then the rebound got stuffed home. He got a wicked goal on the power play, a one-timer, and just snapped it in before goalie had any chance to get over there. A hell of a shot. And then he he got a wicked penalty when he, he hammered this guy with a, I would say, pretty dirty hit. He definitely deserved the two minutes, and he could have possibly even got more than that. And... He's uh, starting to, uh, I shouldn't say starting to, but periodically uh, when he amps up his physical game, he's like a raging bull out there because he's huge. 6'4", you know, 215. Yeah, and he's got skill and he's got a, you know, a nasty edge to him that bubbles through from time to time. Yeah, if he does play with a harder edge in a physical game, he can make it in the NHL. Absolutely. Yeah, he can because he's got the skill to do so. And maybe he's going to come to that like hardcore realization like this. I've got to do this every time I'm out there. I got to take take a piece of someone with a hit. The The Condors are have had a pretty tough time 
with the forwards on their team this year in terms of development, Bruce. There's been a lot of injuries and just, frankly, a lot of disappointment. Yep. Xavier Bargo has had a mediocre year, point-wise. I haven't seen him play, so I don't know what's going on there. I mean, Tyler Tulio, who there was hopes for, has been injured. Mm -hmm. um, it's not putting up points. Um, Matt V. Petrov's come on a little bit lately, I guess. Um, but the, there, there's, and I don't know, did we mention this last podcast? Maybe you did mention it, that, that, that uh, Philp has. Uh, I, I, I meant to, and I didn't know if Philp's come out of retirement. Uh, yeah. It's, not, it's, it's been made clear that he will end his one-year retirement, which in modern vernacular could better be described as stepped away from the game. For a year to deal with some issues in his personal life and uh, uh, very very difficult situation. And anyway, he's uh, apparently I'd hoped all along that this would be just a temporary thing because I think he would have been on the team this year, David. Oh, the way, I think so. The way things unfolded when they I, called up Hamblin early in the year, that would have yeah. been Phil. Yeah, Nora Philp, 6'3", 200-pound right shot center with a really good shot who can win faceoffs, who's apparently responsible defensively. He he sounds made to order yeah. for the Edmonton Oilers and an inexpensive player. So you know, I, I um, it's not it's unlike like Adam Henrique's another guy. Like in terms of next year, can they keep him? Like you know, he's a good. I like it. I'm starting to really like Adam Henrique's game. He scored a nice goal going to the net tonight. He's such a smart hockey player, and I know some people don't see it. There, there's some criticism, like, um, and that's fair enough. Like, he's not, his, he's his not. His numbers are poor, and if you put a whole lot of stock in the numbers above everything else, then you're not going to like him. Well, not and, those numbers, I don't. And, but and it's it's too early. Like, he's still finding his way here. They're still not quite sure if they're going to use him as a center, or as a winger. Last couple games, he's played a wing with Leon. He scored a goal in each of those games. You know. And um, he's uh, scored three goals, and all of them were unethical goals from the edge of the crease. <laughs> <laughs> I hear his daddy is rich as well. Uh, yeah, and he was, you know, like he had six hits in this game tonight, two block shots. You know, like he was, he's he's got more game than just you know smooth sort of part time scorer on your middle six. Like he's he, he's got some some dimension to his game uh he's also 34 years old not very fast yeah and so if you're going to sign i don't see them signing Corey perry and adam henry let's put it that way because i think they're going to want to inject some some speed in there i don't know if they sign at the right price mm -hmm. there's a chance they would sign both of them right. and listen and again like what happens next is it will determine that. Like if they both play well in the playoffs, they'd sure they'd want him back. And Henrik, um, he like what we've been looking for all year is players who can play on a line with Leon Drysaddle, right? Yep. Who can get it done with Drysaddle? Yep. Well, tonight we kind of saw. I thought the Drysaddle mm -hmm. line looked good, and um, mm -hmm. Fogel was making Leon plays with Drysaddle. Henrik was making plays with Drysaddle. Leon looked really good. Good defensively, um, too. Eh? He, was, he was good defensively. Three Bruce. steals, three steals he had, and they were, they were just pickpockets, you know. So if he fits with Drysaddle, I mean, this is huge. This is this was a big, yeah. you know. It's inter I was wondering, like, okay, if the orders had gone into this game with different lines, would they have come up with the same result just because they were so focused and wanting to be disciplined this game and wanted to beat the Kings? Maybe the lines didn't have anything to do with it, or maybe the lines were a big part of it. But these lines did work really well tonight. They all worked. And all three of the yeah. top lines worked. And so did the bottom. All four of the lines worked. Mm -hmm. So um, that's great. That's what we need because it's not been working. It's been all discombobulated and not working out. So this is the first time in a long time where the lines look good too. So fingers crossed. The penalty kill worked. The power play worked. Everything worked. Well, they had, uh, they had it was a, a fantastic game, near perfect game in a lot of ways. I love that penalty ways. kill uh, rush with Brown and Yanmark. Oh, Yanmark yeah. Yanmark just flew right by the defenseman. And, oh, Talbot just barely kept that one out. Uh, those guys are good on the kill. Uh, 
Oh, Bruce. But they're that's... not all coming back, David. That's for no, sure. They're not. Like it's they're an not. eternal competition for ice time this year and for potential contracts for next year because basically all those guys are on expiring contracts. They are. Yeah. So, and all right, Adam Bruce. Henrique won't be making 5.8 million on his next contract. I think he will that not. Much is uh, fairly evident. He will not. Bruce, though, they play sun Saturday, Saturday afternoon, afternoon in Anaheim. All right, we'll talk uh, then, Bruce. At, at Edmonton versus Anaheim. Oh, at Edmonton. All right. Thanks for talking, Bruce. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>